I'm a branch of service, United States Army. The wars I served in was World War II, uh, Korea, and uh, Vietnam area. These were the areas of war. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> My highest rank was Lieutenant Colonel. The interviews was Scotty Springston, Don Byers, and Carrie Wren. Cameron's son, Barbara Dorr, and Marlene Waters. Great. Thank you so much for coming, Frank. We really appreciate it. We started all these interviews off by asking, tell us what you remember about December 7th, 1941. Okay. December 7th, 1941, I was in West Palm Beach, Florida, and my uh, parents' house, of course. And I remember, <coughs> excuse me, lying on the piano uh, stool, was in front of a piano in the house there, and uh, but the radio was on, and all, and I was listening, I remember distinctly, to uh, Sir John Barbaroli. He was the English. A conductor, and he was playing Handel's Water Music Suite uh, by Sir John Barbaroli, and it was interrupted. We interrupt this program to uh, for a bulletin that uh, the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Of course, I had no idea where Pearl Harbor was or what it was, but this is very distinct. I remember where it was. What was the react? What was your reaction and your family's reaction to this news? Uh, it was amazement, all kinds of, uh, 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 I would say, uh, reaction to it. It was something we, it just it was unheard of. First of all, we didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. And number two, when it, they bombed Pearl Harbor, we had anything from believing it was next to, we thought big, it was in California someplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was probably continental United States rather than uh, the uh, contingent, I may call it such. Tell us what, li what life was like for you as a, as a boy growing up. <coughs> well, life was, I said, it was, uh, it was mixed. And first of all, I, was, I, I grew up in a, a highly segregated uh, society in 1941. The, uh, country itself was had had a different attitude toward people of color and as a boy I was in this my hometown was heavily segregated to the point of, uh, of physical uh, uh, demarcations as to where what we were called Negroes at those days Negroes lived and uh, socialized they were restricted to certain areas but uh, everything supposed to have been separate and equal, but it was separate and unequal, period. Well, did you, did you feel like, what, what it, try to explain to us what it was like to be a young black kid in, a, in, a, in that society. Did you feel discriminated, did you feel discriminated against, or did you just accept life as it was? Well, odd enough, initially, I <coughs> accepted as it was, when I grew up, this was a society. I followed the rules and so forth. But oddly enough, <clears throat> it was the school system that changed things. When I started going to school and uh, we started studying about uh, the country and different things, then I began to question why was this so? And then I began to feel as I went on and I, I saw movies newspapers I think I, I was I found that uh, that it was heavy discrimination and I felt very uh, for an example the uh, at school we used to sing what we call a song called a Negro National Anthem which we know now is lift every voice and sing <clears throat> the uh, Star Spangled Banner uh, was something that the whites uh, did, and uh, we the American flag when they raised it at the school there, uh, they played the Star Spangled Banner. But I would use the 
and looked the other way or put my hand in my pocket. It didn't have any meaning, but whenever they sang, they sang Lift Every Voice and Sting, I would stand at attention and jump up because at that time I was a Negro mm -hmm. with small N, of course, just felt a small N. But uh, th this was, was basically what happened. But then when I began to grow up and, and uh, study in school and newspaper and so forth, then I began to see that uh, the discrimination was designed for one group. The others, uh, for example, there were foreigners uh, who came from Cuba. If you look at Florida, or the Cubans, the uh, Mexicans that came in that area, they were treated differently from uh, what we were, the Negroes. And of course, the uh, political system found uh, no uh, Negroes were allowed to vote or to hold any type of political office in the particular area. But, uh, I know you speak yeah. to a bunch of, a lot of young people. They must find this just incredible. Yeah. They just don't yeah. realize how yeah. bad things were. Okay, look, well, you, you, you the, the events of Pearl Harbor, and then you became involved in the military. Tell us how you ended up in the military and about the famous Tuskegee mm -hmm. experiment. Okay. Well, oddly enough, <clears throat> It was a movie star, believe it or not, that really caused me to uh, get involved. So, well, first of all, but before that, I remember way back reading in the paper about uh, Charles A. Lindbergh. Uh, Lindbergh it was uh, because the uh, white American, American, I may call, who had uh, flown Atlantic uh, so long first, and they used to have toys. I remember the toys. Now this is back, I if I can go back, around 1928, something like that. I was just a youngster. But we used to buy these little toys, you could wind them up, and it had a cross, I remember this thing, from New York to Paris on it, and you could wind them up and they'd go all around the place. It was fascinating. I liked airplanes. Well, later on, as I said, when I would go to the movies, yeah, they had segregated movies there, and uh, I remember seeing a movie called The Dawn Patrol, and there's a guy named Earl Flynn was a movie star, and he had his buddy Scotty, and uh, they would go up and they would fight the uh, Red Baron, von Richthofen. And I would sit back in the back of this little segregated movie and um, imagine myself, you know, flying with the Royal Air Force. Now, this is real odd for, I guess when you're young and got hair, you, <laughs> you know, your, your fantasies go all over. But I would sit there and I would see the movie over and over again. I, I, I was fascinated by the flights and so forth. Well, later on, you see, when the, uh, World War II broke out, I got a little in school. Then I transferred my fantasies from flying uh, against the Red Baron to flying against the German Luftwaffe, or uh, her Gehring. Gehring was head of the German Air Force. Mm -hmm. I used to read it all the different people who were fighting. England was fighting, of course, long before we got into it and uh, France. But uh, I would imagine myself fighting her Gehring himself, you see. And uh, this is fantasy. But uh, later on, when I got up in, in, the, uh, in the high school, there, uh, I saw an ad in the paper saying that they needed uh, young men men, of course, this one because it'll come back later on. We were not considered men at that time. The people would say, so many men and so many Negroes did something, you see. It always distinguished. That was our local paper rather than just saying men. When they said men, that meant white. But uh, they would distinguish. Anyway, they wanted uh, uh, young men to uh, enlist in the Army Air Corps for cadet training. So on a whim, I signed up. The, the papers and send them back, you know, in the mail. Lo and behold, I got a letter that did come back and said that I had been, my application, because I was in high school then, and because I had been uh, accepted. And I was to report to a place called Morrison Air Force Base, right out of West Palm Beach, Florida, to take the cadet, uh, to take examination for the cadet. And so, that's what I did. 
So when the time came, I went down and got in the back of the bus and went out to this air base there. And uh, it's another experience I ran into. When I got there, again, there was 19, about 19 young men, two of which, of course, were Negroes. I was one of the Negroes there. And when we got to the door, the uh, instructor says, Negroes sit in the hallway right there at the door. Then the whites, of course, the others went in. This, of course, now, this sounds odd, but this was in keeping with the policies of the land. See? Well, I sat in the hallway with the other guy. About halfway through the test, we, we passed the paper out and we were taking the test. This other Negro guy got up and says, words to this effect, if I can remember correctly, are you going to sit here in the hallway and be humiliated by these blanket of blank so and so <laughs> you fill in the good question. But I had to make a choice, I think to look back now. Uh, in order to get in the air corps, you know, get to be a cadet, you had to pass the test, take the test. By the same token, to be humiliated and sit in the hallway was was really something, you know, do I really want to do this? Well the other guy he solved the problem immediately. He looked at me and he he took his paper and he tore it up and threw it down and he walked to the door and says, are you coming? And I just sat there and I, I said, well, to my own self, it's a, I have to do something about this test because there's no way I can get in and I wanted so much to get in. So I decided to stay. I stayed and I took the test. I remember the guy, he looked at me, shook his head, walked away. When the test was over, instructor came around, he picked them all up and he got my paper and looked at it and says, sorry boy, you didn't pass, better luck next time. So I was devastated there. Well, oddly enough, one of the young, other the white guys came over and said, look, I saw what happened. And uh, there's a place over in Tuskegee, Alabama, so you have to look at it, Florida's here, but mm -hmm. Alabama's on this area, the other side of the country. A place in, called Tuskegee, Alabama, where they train you people. So I was a you people now instead of a Negro. It was called a you people. And uh, if you will join the Army Air Corps, because I was still a civilian, Army Air Corps, and tell them you want to go to the Army Air Corps, then you go to Tuskegee. Then after you're on active duty for uh, about 90 days or so, then you can take the test again so forth. And that was it. So that's what happened. So I got my, signed up, papers came, and for me to report to active duty. So I went to a place in Miami, Florida, then up to Camp Blanding, Florida, over to Fort Benning, Georgia, basic training, then from there to Maxwell Air Force Base, this is based in Ala and, uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and then finally over to the Promised Land, Tuskegee. That's how I finally got there. Tell us about Tuskegee. <laughs> well, this is my personal observation, okay, today. If you're a bad person, I'll say this, on earth, and you die, you know what's going to happen to you, don't you? You're going to go down below. You go down below, and you're still bad. They say, Satan, we've got a bad person here on earth, it came from earth, rather. What can we do about it? Well, paint them black and send them up to Tuskegee, you see. <laughs> That'll straighten them out. It was horrible. First of all, the, the command of the base at that time, well, see, Congress incident, I have to jump a little bit. I kick Congress. Was at, uh, somehow or another, they had come to, to terms due to political reasons that, that uh, Tuskegee experiment, so to speak, which was to see whether people of color could uh, fly uh, airplanes, do sophisticated technical work and so forth. They had come to the conclusion that this was impossible, they couldn't do it. There had been a study, 1925, by the War Department, who says that people of color were cowards, illiterate, and they could never do anything other than uh, menial work. Okay? And of course this attitude had permeated in the higher 
echelon of the, of the people who were in charge of the military base. And this guy particularly hadn't got there. His name was, he was a colonel, white of course, all, of, all the staff up there were white. His name was Frederick Von Kimball. I remember Kimball very well. And he was carrying out this segregation to the best of his ability, you see, as much as he could. In fact, we used to say, without him knowing it, of course, that each morning, Kimball had two guests to come and eat breakfast with him. One of his guests was named Adolf Hitler, and the other one was Satan. And he had breakfast with these three, you see, <laughs> because they represent the very, uh, well, anyway, it was, segregation was uh, unique to the fact that folks, the base was uh, segregated. The white uh, con uh, cadre that was there to train these blacks lived in the area for themselves. But then the blacks within themselves had a strange system. For an example, blacks who uh, primarily came from the north uh, would look on blacks who were born and raised in the south because they un couldn't understand how you young men can lay down here, uh, stay here in the south and take all of this and we don't know nothing about it. Of course, in the north, they had a different type of segregation, the gentleman's agreement, if you wish. But the South had the outright uh, down and out segregation. So they would segregate against themselves, you know, within the black community. The uh, blacks who were fair skinned would discriminate against the blacks of dark skin. Sure. Most of the girls who were fair skinned would, uh, we call it pretty hair, so they would get certain. Uh, uh, treatment different from the girls of dark skin and the other hair. And of course the men uh, segregated it. Of course the whites segregated against all of them, period. <laughs> but it was really a hodgepodge. It, it, it was real good. But uh, I was there at the base almost three or four days. Looked like for even but I didn't know I was even there on it. But it, it was not not too good. But, uh, Tell us about the area of Tuskegee. I think you've mentioned before it was really a, a pretty grim place. The, wasn't it a mosquito swamp or something like that? Yeah, it's just located, well, Tuskegee, uh, the city of Tuskegee uh, was in one area, say, but about six, I guess about six miles out from the city is where the Tuskegee uh, Air Base was, the base. At Tuskegee itself, the, the, the college, they had a primary training, which was part of a contract that the military had made with the uh, uh, Tuskegee Institute. They were, uh, had uh, civilian instructors to uh, train the uh, uh, cadets. And when the cadets passed the uh, primary course by the which were taught by the uh, civilian instructors, then they would move them out to the air base on it. But the air base itself, it was out in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. on it. Uh, they, but they had uh, some uh, oddly enough black contractors at the time, Negroes, we still called Negroes. Black was a bad word, incidentally, when that came up. You didn't say black, Negroes, colored, and so forth, but black, but anyway, these contractors, the first time they've had uh, people of color to uh, do this type of work. So they had contractors come out to build an air base up there, primarily of black on it, which was an economic boom to quite a people there mm -hmm. on it. But it was way out. So what kind of training, what kind of aircraft were they training in? Well, they had uh, started off with, with uh, the, what they call a Piper Cub type aircraft. And then it moved into the uh, AT-6, as they call them, mm -hmm. uh, the old uh, Texan, the two-seater sure. thing. Mm -hmm. And then they had some old uh, P-40s, the ones uh, that the Flying Tigers used to have. Mm -hmm. They even had the, the uh, uh, painting on it. You know, they had the P-40 with the that looks like a Tiger's uh -huh. sure, old uh, uh, Chenault, <laughs> probably throwing them away or something. But this is type, and incidentally, uh, after being around the base there about three days, I, I signed myself literally to the uh, 
flight line. He used to hang around the flight line, and he finally put me to the official, put me on, and I was uh, as a uh, airplane mechanics helper and uh, everything else, two room, so forth. Uh -huh. But I had made up in my mind you know, that I'd, I'd try to learn all I could about those aircraft because maybe one day I'd get a chance to fly, you see. So I wanted to learn all I can about it. But uh, I worked on, on these planes uh, as an airplane mechanic helper. So how long did you stay at Tuskegee? Well, at the base itself, I was there on, uh, about, uh, oh, let me see, it went in, in uh, July, August, September, October, November, I guess about four or five months almost. And then I, I uh, was sent to another place. Well, incidentally, I'm getting ahead of myself on it. Uh, in, in, in addition to being an airplane's mechanic helper, I was also working on radio uh, communications. The radios, you know, that, that they had in, in the aircraft on it, my job was to help get those operating. So they sent me from Tuskegee up to a place called Scott Air Force Base in Illinois, right outside of East St. Louis. And uh, I was sent up there to see, well, again, I was, I didn't realize at the time, but I was part of this experiment, <laughs> guinea pig, to see whether or not, uh, I was a Negro still then, I was Negroes, I'd moved up, I'd moved up to colors. You'd be surprised, it was a bit something to who you were and how they addressed you, you see. Mm -hmm. But when I went up to Illinois, then I became a colored uh, boy. I was still a boy, but a colored boy. And uh, I was sent up to see whether or not we colors could learn to do uh, what you call radio communications. Radio communications system of transmitter receivers. You had to know Morse code. You had to know uh, frequency modulations. Uh, you had a uh, uh, different type of Doppler effect. Uh, the whole works of, of electronics, they showed it. And we had to of course, you had to do up to, uh, I got up to about 13 to 20, uh, almost 18 words a minute doing a dots and dash type mm -hmm. thing. And you had to do voice communication, speech pattern, and uh, of course, electron theory. 22 weeks I was up there. And then when I finished, uh, they had started up what they call a, a, a bomber group. This is another part for it. at Tuskegee initially, it was set up to train fighter aircraft, mm -hmm. fighter pilots. Mm -hmm. Then later on, they decided to have, uh, uh, see whether these colors could fly uh, and work on uh, uh, multi-engine aircraft, uh, B-25s and so forth. And they started a unit, of course, they had to use crewmen, a, a six, eight crewmen, the pilot, co-pilot, the mechanics, radio operators, gunners, the whole work, the whole crew. And I was supposed, again, to go on, uh, as a radio operator on a uh, bomber at the time. But lo and behold, some of the guys went up to Selfish Field, Michigan in my class. Some went to Godman Field, Kentucky. Yours truly went back down to <laughs> Tuskegee, back down to the Promised Land. And I spent the whole war at uh, oh, really? Tuskegee. and then. Except the ones encouraged us. Another little air base, maybe people never heard of it. A place called Dothan, Alabama, on it. And this was sort of a, I don't know, suburb, I call it, of Tuskegee Airmen. We'd, we'd go, uh, go over there, I was assigned for a while to work on AT. They had AT6s over there. But majority the whole time was there in Tuskegee. Hmm. Spent the whole war there. Very bitter. So, so you, spent, you spent the remainder of your. your of the war there at Tuskegee. At then. Tuskegee, the biggest, yeah. Okay. So finally, when, of course, when uh, something else went, when uh, I was uh, discharged, I had a break in service. The war was over in 1945. Okay. I was discharged, November 45. I was uh, discharged, and uh, I took my uniform and threw it away, tore it up. Went back to uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, but something had happened. I wasn't able to fit in the environment again like I'd, I'd grown up in. 
I, I looked at things differently, and I was, well, first of all, uh, uh, my relationship with whites came different on it. Because before we were supposed to uh, look on them as being Mr. and uh, so on and so forth. But uh, I, I had looked on them as being, because due to my, uh, I think, primarily work at around Illinois or someplace, when I was at Scott Air Force Base, we got a little more uh, relationship with whites as being another human being. And I felt that I shouldn't have to get off the side. For example, when I was at Tuskegee, if you walked down the street in the city and whites were coming like so, you'd have to get off the sidewalk and they'd let them by, one. Number two, you couldn't look them directly in the eye when you talked with them. That was threatening, you see. And in that time, any white could uh, arrest any black on what they call a citizen's arrest. He could, refer, if he's off a threatening term. It was really weird. But anyway, I, I, I couldn't fit in and, uh, uh, with the system again. So one of the guys said, look, you get in trouble if you keep acting like you get it Why don't you do something with yourself? They had what they call the GI Bill had come out that time. He said, you, you been to, uh, in, in the military, you went to school there and so forth. Why don't you do something with yourself? There's a place up in Virginia called Hampton Institute. And uh, with your background in the military, why don't you go up there and do something with yourself? If you stay around here, you're going to get in trouble. So that's what I did. I just left home, backed up, and came up here to Hampton Institute. So what did you do when you got to Hampton? Okay, that's, an, that's another episode. Well, I came up with a chip on my shoulder. I was really, really still bitter about it. A, I had no patriotism whatsoever. I was out to do what I wanted to do. But I found out that at Hamp they had an ROTC program going on up there, and uh, they paid $19 a month, which is big money in '46 on it, and uh, with my GI Bill and uh, ROT, if I joined ROTC, I'd be getting a nice little income, you see. Mm -hmm. Besides, it only put two years you got a commission. Uh, I didn't realize that Tom Hampton University, uh, Institute rather, had never had an ROTC program that was r recognized by the regular army. It was a, a uh, sort of a, what do you call it, academic type thing. They would dress and so forth, but after two years, everybody had to take, or men take ROTC because the uh, founder of Hampton Institute at the time was a guy named a, general, a brigadier general from the Civil War, Samuel Chaplin Armstrong. He had founded it. And of course, he carried, he figured all, oh, should dress in a little uniform, you know, military he carried over. So uh, I thought it was a little goody thing, a good place to make some money and to goof off. So. I joined up with the, the, the ROTC. Meanwhile, I was pursuing industrial, vocational industrial education as a major in college. So I did pretty good. In two years, I was, got a commission in the reserve. He said, Coast Artillery. Fort Monroe was the parent place where he said, Coast Artillery. Uh, I was a junior in college, but um, I, I was, I was a commission second lieutenant in the Coast Artillery Reserve. And I was really good So that. I was another, I was being a crook. Anything I could do to get a little money, I would do so. But I had no, the flag and all that other business as somebody else's. But I got caught in my own trap, you see, because after a while, around 1950, something happened in the Far East that changed my life. The Korea broke out. And you know what happened when you break out the war at the Korea? They came around and tapped all the reserves and started breaking them in. I tried to hide under the bush, fainted, everything, not to go in. But I got caught. I was called to active duty. You were out of school at this time. You no. Didn't, no, you were still I in was school. Still, yeah, yeah. I got commissioned in two years. Mm -hmm. I had two more years to go because I stayed for uh, a bachelor's BS degree in the vocational industrial education. So I got around and I pulled a, called, pulled a few strings and so forth. And the guy told me, well, Gordon, you almost on a degree. 
ask for a delay of uh, what, what they call it, but you can get an extension. You can stay in school and still finish, finish your degree and then report for active duty. So I was a good chance to delay. I figured by that time the war would be over and everybody, oh, 1950. So that's what I did. So the military, they, believe it or not, they gave, it, gave me the extension and I stayed until uh, uh, I finished my degree. And lo and behold, the guy from Fort Monroe says, okay, they said, Horn, report to <laughs> Fort Bliss, Texas, in uh, uh, August there, you see, of a certain time. But something had happened, nothing like this one. You see, during that time, Harry Truman was the president of the United States, and he had issued what they call an executive order, which on paper integrated the services. 1948, I think it was, or something like that. That's on paper. In reality, not so. The, the uh, commanders, they tried everything else to evade this particular <laughs> Uh, uh, not available for it to do, not to integrate the services as such. Because when I uh, got to Fort Bliss, I was assigned to a segregated unit. Okay. But another thing happened there. Truman, and he was very uh, dogmatic in his uh, orders, and he had put out, he wanted the units to integrate, period. And he had what they call an inspector general, IG we'd call him. He used to go around to see whether or not these units were complying with this executive order. And that's where I got into a, something. You see, these uh, people came up with a nice way of applying with the orders. They found out, and this goes all the way back, I think, from uh, maybe Civil War or something. All they needed <coughs> was one black, a Negro, color, what do you want to call that? We, we were still colored Negroes. Just one in the unit, and that would integrate it. Sort of like in the northern part, we found later on that in the suburbs, I'll tell you what, I was, I, when I did some, I was on duty up there in Pittsburgh. But anyway, in the suburbs, if you had one Negro family in there, that would integrate the unit, you see. So they wanted to, no Negro, that's all they needed to integrate. So we call ourselves necessary Negroes. I was one. <laughs> I was picked since I had a degree, lieutenant, and so forth, and necessary Negro to go in and integrate these units, you see. Really, like you're a museum piece, really, for the IG. When the IG came out, oh, we have one, here's, here's, here, you see. We integrate. But I don't know. I, I enjoyed the work I was doing then on it. Uh, so what because, were you doing then? Okay, I was assigned, since I had a little background, as a, uh, again, communications. See, they had a radar was just coming out on it, and that guided missiles, if I'm coming up right, the guided missiles. And uh, oddly enough, I was, uh, at the unit, I was put in as a radar officer sister radar officer. And then later on, I was assigned to the school there at Fort Bliss, Texas, guided missile school, to study the uh, guided missiles and uh, uh, communications on it. So rather than being a figurehead or something, I actually got into the program itself. Mm -hmm. And I was doing pretty good. And uh, so they forgot that I was just supposed to be a figurehead. <laughs> I was really doing, doing a good job on it. So then they would move me from this place and put me on the staff there as, the, again, the first Negro to be on the staff there to teaching, uh, you know, guided missile radar, anti-aircraft, and so forth. And from then on, they just got moved from one unit to another to integrate the, the uh, place. So now how long a period are you talking about here that you were moving around like this? Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, 51 through 50, 54, 59, I went to Germany in 59, from around, around uh, 51 through, I say about five, six years maybe mm -hmm. on it. And you were progressing country. along lieutenant to major, to captain yeah. to major and so forth. Yeah. Captain, sir. Yeah. Uh, around. I was even sent up, like I said, out to Pittsburgh uh, during the Cold War. 
they were putting guided missiles around the uh, areas on at Pittsburgh. It's a place called South Park, uh, Pittsburgh, South Park. They had these guided missiles, Nike Hercules, they call them, Nike Ajax. And I was sent there as a, to see whether or not a Negro could command a unit. I was a young captain then. And uh, 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 that was part of this moving around as, as being the necessary one. But uh, the units, are, because I, I, would, I, I just worked hard and I enjoyed it and I felt comfortable when I was able to do something, then I, I could look the guy in the eye and, and uh, if he didn't like me, it was prejudice and which way they were, then I said, well, you have a problem, I don't have a problem, you see. I put the bite on him mm -hmm. on it. But uh, th th this was a good, I went all the way around, back and forth, and uh, I guess all the way up to I said from one unit to another, and then finally I went back to Bliss, and there was Germany on it. And I was moving from uh, Schweibrücken to Primersons to Mannheim to Wiesbaden, worked with the air base, uh, all the way back around. So I finally got out of there in, in, the, in the 19, when the Cuban crisis came up, at uh, 62. 62. I came back from Germany in 62, and I was assigned to Fort Meade, Maryland there with the uh, five second, uh, five, sixty second, and the aircraft they had around Washington, D.C. And I was now put in charge of the battalion operations section there. Really something again. And uh, again, still carrying the Negro symbol type of thing, of call it. So you were uh, w one of the only black officers there? Yeah, then. Okay. that's right. They kept, uh, they, were, they were very, quarter type or whatever it is, but I was the only one that was in the in the operations section. And then later on, I became the operations officer itself. I have a certificate where they gave me for it. It was quite a thing during the Cuban crisis because we stayed, we kept our unit on alert and I kept them all running at one time. Even I only had a sergeant to help me out, but I was just, got my little bag and shoes and toothbrush and I just moved over on there at Fort Meade, Maryland. I just stayed on base mm -hmm. for a time. So the what did fire. you do after that assignment? Okay, finally sent me up to Niagara Falls there and, and uh, that was an odd one too, I might tell you, this is odd. Somehow or another, to, they messed up in the record, they didn't know who I was. So I had a good record, outstanding and so forth. So they sent me to a place called Watertown, New York, way up there in the top. And uh, I was assigned there. Beautiful. But when I got up, the people took one look at me and says, huh? Because there, the military would uh, give you your housing off base. There was no military post per se, such, and no place. So the people at Watertown did not take kindly to someone coming in who was not of their color. So they automatically flipped me over and sent me down to Niagara Falls, New York there, and where I became uh, working in the operations again section. They had uh, uh, these, what do you call these? Uh, the uh, uh, oh, Hughes aircraft put them out. The big units that was, was uh, would control a, a target selector type things. We would select... The SAGE know, system? Yeah. The SAGE system? Something, yeah. yeah. I think it was something okay. like that. But anyway, we'd select targets and assign them to different. We'd control a bunch of the, the firing units, but we would control where. Well, I'll tell you just a moment. I slipped my mind, but I did the same thing in Korea. But uh, I, I was uh, in charge of one of those units that uh, would select target selections, save system, and then uh, assign these targets, enemy targets coming into the uh, firing batteries and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I stayed there, and I also the supply officer. I stayed the whole, uh, uh, oh, I guess about a three, almost three years up there in Niagara Falls. And the last one, I went over from there to uh, Korea. Okay. That's right, 1965. This is the, when I really began to stand tall, uh -huh. I didn't realize, but I really had a complete run. Because when I went to Korea, 1965, 
I was assigned to a place called Inchon, Korea, on it, and there's an area where the uh, Marines had come in with uh, MacArthur and his his uh, in run, and they had up on the mountain a place called Walmart or up on top. They had one of these units, the Air Defense Command Post, I think they call it. And I had one, two, three, about different fine batteries. We'd we'd select targets again, like I did in, in Niagara Falls, and they would assign them to these units. I was a young major then, real type, but. Uh, I had about uh, almost a, a battalion-sized unit because we had Koreans working with us, quite a few. But this it was something different because there I was the boss of, of my unit. The old man would come down, he'd check on it, but I was really in command. I carried the whole works. I had the guys, and I felt real proud of myself. You see? Some might say on this, of course, is where they... An event took place again, which changed me over, because uh, unfortunately I bring I got some pictures I think of this in it. But uh, at a meeting like so, one of the Korean officers said, "Well, let's hear what the American had to say about this particular item uh, thing we were talking about." And he got quiet like he, yeah, and he looked right at me. You see, and it didn't dawn on me for a moment, and suddenly he said, "Look." The guy called him American. He didn't say uh, Negro, Afro-American, uh, 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 or you know, colored something. He said American with all the privileges and responsibility that go to be an American. Then he kept saying, "Well, in your country, you do this, and my country, I do this." And then I was American, and I had a country. You see, nobody had ever told me this is my country as such. When the president and somebody come up and make a speech, America wants us, he's not talking about you, he's talking about the other people. But I was American, and I felt American. He treated me as such. Not once they say, well, there's a Negro officer, or the colored officer, or the minority officer, or what an American officer, what I was, commanding a unit of Americans. You see? And it did something. And, uh, of course, as I said, I lost all my hair. <laughs> no, every bit of it went <laughs> Never got it back, you see. But it did. I was able to walk tall, you see. And I said, this is where I was. So then I tell the newspaper and everything else said, I'm an American, just like now. When census come around, I'm an American <laughs> of African heritage. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I'm an American first of African heritage second, just like President Bush is an American of European or Scottish heritage. Uh, Sanchez. General uh, in uh, 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 Iraq, Jeff mm -hmm. Sanchez, I, I, I read about him. He's an American or Hispanic, but he's American, and he did something, you see. So from then on, I would walk in the sunlight now, you see.